the world draws closer to catastrophe day by day. Following a re-centralization of power, a surge in population, and a massive remilitarization effort, the Russian Federation finally made a grab for the whole of Ukraine. The European powers prepared an intervention, but were halted by Russian threats of nuclear retaliation. With NATO disbanded, the United States refused to involve itself in the European affair, and Britain felt no obligation to participate in a continental conflict which primarily concerned the European Union, leaving only the small nuclear arsenal of France to counter that of Russia. But before going any further, I'd like to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, Private Internet Access, the world's most transparent VPN provider, now with over 30 million downloads. As any good VPN should, PIA reroutes your internet traffic through an encrypted channel, hiding it from potentially nefarious actors. As we've already mentioned, PIA is big on transparency. They're 100% open source, giving you an opportunity to inspect the code yourself to see just how secure it really is. Private internet access boasts being the most customizable VPN on the market, allowing you to tailor your VPN experience to your liking while also providing you protection from ads, trackers, and malicious websites to ensure your total comfort and security online. Private internet access is so dedicated to customer satisfaction that if you're not completely happy with your purchase within the first 30 days, you can request a full refund. Digital privacy is just a click away, and if you follow the link in the description, you can enjoy PIA's service for less than $2 per month, plus 4 months free when you sign up for a 3-year plan. Once again, that's digital privacy and security totally risk-free at less than $2 per month, plus 4 months free. Links in the description. Now, back to the video. Ultimately, Ukraine fell. And though the Russian giant appeared to go dormant for a time, everyone suspected it held intentions for the Baltic states as well. It was only a question of when. France, seeing itself as the only country that could challenge Russia's nuclear hegemony on the continent, took it upon itself to dramatically expand its nuclear arsenal, buying up every gram of uranium it could from its former colony of Niger, and collaborating with Germany to produce the weapons en masse in a short span of time. This buildup was done secretly at first, but once the French stockpile reached 3,000 warheads, this new might was loudly and proudly paraded in a show of force against Russia. Germany and the Eastern European EU members fortified their borders and built up their conventional arsenals in the meantime, making clear that any attempt by Russia to conquer the Baltic states would be met with extreme force. Russia's nuclear deterrent, though not yet matched, was now challenged, but even if France could deal a devastating blow upon Russia, the Russians remained confident in the fact that they could hit much harder. This bravado demonstrated by Russia in the face of possible nuclear annihilation led many on both sides to fear that an exchange was now very likely. The mood had shifted from preventing a likely war to surviving an inevitable catastrophe. In France, work began on a series of vaults which could preserve a large enough portion of the population for several decades if need be providing them with all the technology and resources necessary to create a sustainable ecosystem both within the vault and on the surface once it was safe to re-emerge. The largest and most fortified of these vaults was the Abri Metropolitan, buried deep beneath the Paris catacombs. The vault project was kept a close secret and what details were revealed were often shrouded in obscurity to ensure the protection of the project and the survival of these populations. Because of that, when vault plans were shared with other EU member states, the plans were often incomplete, leaving these states to fill in the gaps themselves and thus produce their own unique designs. Multiple major vaults were constructed in every EU member state, as were a number of decoy vaults produced to throw the Russians off. The majority of these vaults had a mechanized burrowing system that would allow them to tunnel deeper underground if the need arose, and which post-war would allow the vault to partially resurface and become the foundation for a new city. What made the Paris Vault especially unique aside from its much larger size was its improved blast shielding, highly advanced terraforming technology, and use of multiple nuclear reactors to power the facility. It was believed that Paris would be badly hit in the nuclear exchange, but the pride of France's politicians refused to allow them to surrender the ground of their most sacred city. The city which for centuries had not merely been the largest and most powerful settlement in all of France, but for a time, all of Europe as well. As such, greater efforts were taken to fortify and secure the Paris Vault, even if at the expense of the other vaults within the country and those of other countries. The day everyone feared finally arrived. After much anticipation, Russia finally invaded the Baltic states, and the West retaliated. It's unknown who first resorted to the nuclear option, but the results were catastrophic and impacted the world far beyond the European continent. Several vaults were destroyed or succumbed to collapse in the following decades. The major vaults of Spain, Romania, Germany, and Finland were destroyed immediately. The Grand Vault of the Low Countries was sufficiently damaged enough to cause major flooding and electrical damage, forcing an early evacuation only years after the war. 
The vaults of Poland were discovered and damaged during the conventional war, with the nuclear aftermath wiping out or damaging several many of them and forcing an early evacuation after only one decade. The vaults of Italy and Greece could not sustain large populations as long as the other vaults could and were forced to evacuate around roughly the same time. One century following the war, only five major vaults would survive and remain unopened. It would be another two decades before the opening of the Abri Metropolitan, known to its citizens now as Metropole. It was the single most successful of the vault societies, quickly reaching a population of over one million. Within its first decade, the vault was producing a surplus of food for the entire population, allowing Metropole to cease rationing measures. Technology began to advance at a rapid pace. Commerce based on a production credit system went fully into effect, replacing the pre-war cash system. Every working age adult was employed in some productive occupation, improving upon and maintaining the vault itself, making it feel more like a home. The tremendous demands of maintaining order while the world above collapsed led Metropole to adopt a strict hierarchical governing and societal system. Initial social classes or estates were established based on skill, personality, and background, and were largely inherited from that point on. The wealthiest, most prudent, intelligent, charismatic, and cunning of the population became part of the ruling class of lords, who were led by a chief executive elected from among themselves every decade to rule over the whole of the vault. The lords would serve in intellectual and leadership roles throughout the vault, managing the economy, investigating conditions above, handling legal matters, and overseeing production to name a few. As you might imagine, the lords were afforded the most lavish lives the vault could offer. While the vast majority of vault dwellers had purchased spots for themselves within the vault, the original lords had divided the whole of the vault among themselves and were in essence leasing individual spots out to other inhabitants. As generations passed, these holdings became further divided among new lords as something of an inheritance. These inheritances grew too small, and ambitious lords began funding expansions of the vault in their own names, building it larger and allowing it to sustain a greater population. Some even built new recreational or commercial areas as an alternative way of collecting revenue and enriching themselves as well as the community. Below the lords were the enforcers, security and military personnel responsible for protecting the vault's laws and citizens. They lived nearly as well as the lords did and some enforcers could move up the class hierarchy to become lords themselves, though even still they remained distinguished as lords of the sword. All classes shared a similar curriculum which stressed discipline and loyalty to the executive and the perception of Metropole as the last best pocket of civilization on the planet, the civilization that would one day rebuild the world in its image. Finally below the enforcers were the commoners, laborers, farmers, merchants, engineers, craftsmen, artisans, and the like. Their professions provided them a comfortable lifestyle and access to many of the luxuries the vault had to offer. Members of this class could join the Enforcer class, but it would require a significant upfront investment to provide for weaponry, armor, and training. Further, commoners who became Enforcers would lose access to any inheritance from their old life, essentially forcing them to start from scratch. Changing one's class was a massive undertaking and thus only meant for those dedicated few who truly believed that they belonged elsewhere. Within the commoner class, there were higher and upper classes as well, which varied based on occupation and level of skill within said occupation. Initially, there was concern that extreme competition within the small economic ecosystem would drive many into poverty, especially those less skilled. However, because the initial price to reside within the Paris vault had been so high, only the most successful of their respective fields were able to obtain entry, and selection was conducted to ensure that there wouldn't be an oversaturation of any particular skill set. Meaning that for the first two generations, there was quite literally a planned place for everyone, and the quality of labor began from a high point all across the board. Afterward, expansions of the vault allowed for some more competitive practices, and while some eventually did fall in hard times, many were able to find re-employment in their former competitor's business or entered a new field entirely. The three estates were held firm by their belief in serving a greater goal, the salvation of humanity and the restoration of civilization. The potential for any of these three classes to abuse their power was heavily suppressed by aggressive propagandizing. The education and entertainment sectors repeatedly reminding the population that their failure to cooperate with one another would ultimately bring about humanity's destruction, and if that be the case, then mankind may very well have deserved it. The sense of collective duty for the good of humanity and the threat of total extinction took on an almost religious character, and in fact it did become a key component of Metropolitan Christianity. They understood that they each had a role to play in this new world, and that is precisely what they would do. After 120 years underground, Metropole was ready to resurface. When its inhabitants first emerged, they found the city of Paris completely non-existent. What remained were barely fragments of ruins that nature was gradually reclaiming. But nature was reclaiming the land, and that is precisely what they had been waiting for. A blank canvas upon which to begin again. The surfaced metropole vault stood as a towering fortress among a barren grassy plain. 
visible for miles in any direction. Plots of land were sectioned off and farms were established. Daring commoners began constructing their homes further and further away from the vault, enforcers built up new protective walls to secure the new surface settlements, and exploration parties on horseback were sent out to collect intelligence on what existed beyond the limits of the city once known as Paris. Other vaults were sought out, but it appeared as though none had survived. Most alarming were seemingly abandoned vaults which appeared to have been looted, but by who? It would take weeks of exploration, but finally an answer had been found. After having thoroughly explored the southwest, a new course was set eastward that would go through the Alps, passing Lake Geneva through the Great St. Bernard Pass and into Italy. But upon approaching Geneva, fortifications were found, and the Metropolitan Expedition Team was taken captive. They had stumbled upon the Alpine Empire a well-militarized state which narrowly survived the Third Great War and successfully endured its aftermath. The Empire, originally just a confederation, was well sheltered from the effects of the war thanks to its natural mountain barriers, but eventually the environmental impact had caught up with them, forcing the Alpines to expand in search of an untainted water supply. Munitions factories once belonging to Germany, France, and Italy were occupied as only behind water, weapons became the confederation's most sought-after resource, finding that while governments had collapsed and cities were destroyed, people remained just as desperate as they were, and willing to use any means necessary to acquire what they wanted. Truly, these very first years were brutal. Just as it appeared they had exhausted all leads, the vault of Nice had resurfaced. It had been badly damaged and its life support systems were failing. In sheer desperation, the Alpines raided the vault, but found the population virtually unarmed and willing to share their purified water, their purifiers remaining online and continuing to provide them with a near limitless supply. Recognizing how much death and destruction the world had already endured and seeing a mutually beneficial opportunity, the Alpines offered reliable shelter and protection to the citizens of the Nice Vault in exchange for their technology. The deal was struck, and on that day the Confederation became an empire. Lake Geneva was purified, as were the rivers and springs of the Alps. New settlements sprung up across occupied lands, and every vault population within the Alpine range, located with the aid of the Nice Vault, was claimed under the Empire's protection and it would be through these expansions that the Alpines encountered another great state. To the south was the Greco-Roman Republic, a union of Greek and Italic states centralized along the Ionian Sea. The near simultaneous evacuation of the Italian and Greek vaults two decades following the war forced these populations to endure desperate conditions which their vaults could not alleviate. Both populations suffered terrible losses to disease, starvation, and violence, and the two tribes became nomadic for a time the Italians traveling further down the peninsula, while the Greeks explored the surrounding islands. It would be at the very southern tip of the Italian peninsula that these two populations finally found each other. Conflict nearly broke out, but knowing that they might be entirely alone in this hostile and uncertain world, a pact was struck in the name of their mutual security, future prosperity, and historic partnership. Given the utter breakdown of society, the Republic drew heavy inspiration from antiquity, believing that if their ancestors could build mighty empires from scratch, then they, with at least their knowledge of the past, could not only rebuild, but build something better. The first decade was difficult, and even at present some citizens continue to suffer the effects of radiation sickness. But the Republic did survive, and established commercial relations with the Alpines, who provided them with weapons and water in exchange for spices and precious metals. As the Republic's population grew, so did the need for resources arise. Without terraforming technology, the Republic was limited to a few small regions of arable, unirradiated land not to mention a very limited supply of drinking water. If they were to survive, it seemed that aggressive expansion was their only option. That is, until the discovery of the Croatian Vault, still unopened and almost certainly in possession of the terraforming technology the Republic needed. This vault, however, was under the guardianship of the Alpine Empire, who intended on annexing the vault upon its opening. But to make matters worse, a third and relatively new player had also laid claim to the vault. Only two decades prior to the surfacing of Metropole and a full century following the Third Great War, the vaults of Vienna, Budapest, and Prague surfaced simultaneously. Their close proximity led them to discover one another quickly and forge an alliance that would come to be known as the Eastern Realms, or the Ostgefilde. Nearly as advanced as Metropole in technological and military capabilities, the Eastern Realms rapidly explored and conquered a massive swath of land, identifying various tribal peoples along their border. To the southwest were of course the Alpines, whom they considered a mostly civilized people, albeit still tainted by radiation, and a similar sentiment was held for the Republic to the south. East of the Republic laid an amalgamation of Slavic tribes and petty states, some of whom traced their history back to the invading Russian soldiers who settled in the region following the war. Interestingly, some of these states were vassals of a more powerful pirate polity stationed along the Black Sea. 
To the northeast was the Polish Confederation of Tribes, a friendly and relatively advanced civilization, though one which the Eastern Realm still considered savage. Finally, to the northwest were the Germanic tribes, a brutal population which had endured perhaps the worst that the Great War had to offer. The tribes had raided the Copenhagen Vault, seized its weaponry, and have since utilized it to terrorize other settlements, including their own. Some of the Germanic tribes have been deemed civilized by the Eastern Realms, but there remains a strong hesitation to cooperate with them. The Eastern Realms have set about restoring civilization in their own image, when heavily influenced by the Habsburg Empire of old. Civilizing efforts would be conducted upon those tribes receptive to learning the ways of old, while those tribes who resisted faced eradication or enslavement under converted tribes. The most fortunate of these populations, those deemed to have been minimally affected by radiation, would be condemned to serfdom within the eastern realms. The realms feared that radiation had terribly impacted the genetics of humans on the surface, and as such they felt it was necessary to distinguish these populations as second class. Because of this view, the Eastern Realm's top priority was seeking out and annexing newly discovered vaults, and bringing the untainted population of humanity under a single banner. The Alpines' concern that Metropole would align itself with the Eastern Realms kept the scouting party under observation for several months before finally releasing them, satisfied with the character of those on the team, and requesting that they relay an offer of alliance between the Alpines and Metropolians. With the Rhine held by the Germans and the Mediterranean held by the Republic, the Alps were an ideal central hub for business and a safe gateway to and from each of the realms. On their way back to Metropole, the scouting party found Metropolitan settlements spread far and wide across the north of France, having expanded the one city-state into a network of communities, each with a healthy supply of livestock, crops, merchants, and enforcers. The executive was informed of all that had been discovered, and he conveyed that contact had already been made with a pair of Germanic tribes eager to build an alliance with Metropole on behalf of the Eastern Realms. Further investigations were conducted on the other states, and in the end the executive reaffirmed to the people of Metropole what they had already known. While other states have emerged in this post-war world, Metropole is still the last best hope for humanity. Already the Eastern Realms, Alpines, and Republic were squabbling over land, threatening war with one another as if they could afford to do so. Should the Alpines be allowed to hold a monopoly over so vital a resource as clean water? Could the rapidly growing and expansionist Republic be trusted with a purifier and terraformer, or would they build up a population so overwhelming in size that they would use it to topple their neighbors? Would the Eastern Realms be benevolent leaders who would bring forth a new golden age, or will they exploit their neighbors for their own benefit? By voice or by sword, Metropole was the sole power who could turn the tide in the coming conflict for the last vault. Will they take a side and subjugate the other two states, bringing about peace and order by force, or can they broker a peace through diplomatic means and ensure that the next century is one of cooperation and not of further destruction? Let us know in the comments what side you would take.